So there's a couple things I wanted to kind of go over here today um, because there's been a lot happening in the news, obviously, and it comes at such a rapid pace that you really can't keep up with it if you have like a weekly podcast like I do. Um, but and usually I'll just address what I can uh, in the podcast at the end of the week. But sometimes things happen that are just so dramatic and, and have su- such a profound impact on on the world today, which is the stuff I talk about, at least I think it is, um, then then I have to put out a video of some sort. I have to talk about it. Um, and the first would be obviously yesterday. Today is the 19th of April. So yesterday, the Mueller report was finally released. And to, it's big news in a way, but really at the end of the day, it doesn't tell us anything. Um, there's nothing new that we learned from it that, that William Barr didn't put in his summary. I think it's very interesting that the entire lead up to the release of this report um, the Democrats were trying to suggest that William Barr was running a kind of PR operation for President Trump and was, you know, basically establishing the narrative for Trump so that when the report comes out, the narrative are, has already been set, people have already made up their minds, and which which is effective if that's what he was doing and he if that's what he was doing he did, did a good job at it but i think the facts spoke for themselves the other thing is that they they accused william barr uh in his i think he had a, his summary was was very short uh, Mueller's report is 400 pages um <clears throat> And actually, I I don't think it was a summary of the report specifically, but rather just a, uh, all all Barr did was just go to the end, basically read through the report as fast as he could, and then just put down on paper Mueller's conclusions. Okay, so he didn't leave out any pertinent information. All he was doing in his summary was just putting out the conclusions that Mueller and his team had come to. Okay, so the Democrats ignored that part of it. They also ignored intentionally, I think, Think, and to mislead the public, which is something they're great at, they ignored the fa- they accused William Barr of being biased and selecting information to put in his summary that would benefit President Trump. They they also did this in specifically they did this in reference to the obstruction charge. You know they they. Uh, they they hang off of the fact that the that uh, Mueller says you know while we cannot convict Trump or indict him, well they don't say the word indict. I forget their specific language, but basically on the charge of obstruction, they neither condemn nor exonerate him is one way to put it. I guess I'm not a legal expert, so that's the way I put it. Um, but anyway. They they claim that Barr was you know very selective and biased in in putting together his summary of the Mueller report. What they intentionally don't tell you, whether I don't think they forgot, I think they intentionally just don't tell the public this, is that Rod Rosenstein was also there reading the report. Some of Mueller's own team, uh, his investigative team, helped William Barr put together the summary, uh, but. Specifically, Rod Rosenstein, the acting Inter- deputy attorney general, also came, read the report along with William Barr and came to the same exact conclusions. Rod Rosenstein, the Democrats worshipped at the throne of Rod Rosenstein throughout the investigation because Jeff Sessions had recused himself uh, from overseeing the Mueller probe, and so that left acting uh, deputy, it, it left Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein uh, in the position of being acting Attorney General because Sessions had recused himself. Um, and so the Democrats really worshipped uh, Rod Rosenstein in a lot of ways. They, uh, because he he was very hands off in, in in overseeing the Mueller probe, and a lot of the other things that he did and said throughout that whole process, which over the two years or however long he oversaw it, uh, which I won't go into detail about. But the Democrats were big Rod Rosenstein fans. They they. They loved him. They loved the guy. And now here he is reading the report with William Barr, and they selectively for uh, in the media choose to only highlight the fact that William Barr re- uh, read the report and put it out the summary. 
intentionally making no reference whatsoever to the fact that Rod Rosenstein did it as well. Now, they do this because they can they can point to William Barr as somebody that Trump appointed and therefore is guilty of bias in favor of Trump. They can't do that with Rod Rosenstein, and they know that anyone who's objective is going to go back, or anyone with half a brain, or anyone that's Republican, basically, conservative, uh, will go back and, and see all these positive, uh, very fawning remarks that the Democrat leadership and other progressives, Alyssa Milano types in Hollywood, made about Rod Rosenstein. So this is selective... Um, disparagement uh, being meted out on William Barr with no justification. And now that the report has been released, we know there is no justification. I, I didn't read the entire thing, and I never will. There's no point. I, I've read numerous people's assessment of it. Um, I think I, I've seen no evidence whatsoever that William Barr's uh, summary uh, was not factual and was not true. Nobody on both sides of the argument, on both sides of, of the political spectrum, the Democrats and the Republicans, that's my phone. <laughs> I'm really not that popular. Oh, my wife's at work. Okay. Um, but anyway, both sides of the political spectrum agree that, that, William Barr's summary was true. Now they, of course, will try to twist the narrative as best they can for their own benefits. Uh, there's um, you know, and also to play, to to play cover up for the fact that they lied to us for two years. But you know, you can't. It, it just doesn't work. It falls apart. The facts are out there. That Brian Stelter, uh, Chris Cuomo. Uh, I think it's Chris Cuomo from CNN. I don't watch CNN. But all these people, you know, intentionally, Anderson Cooper, Jim Acosta, uh, not to mention all the Democrats like uh, Jerry Nadler, uh, the pencil neck guy, um, Adam Schiff, uh, Maxine, uh, impeach 45, Maxine Waters, uh, Nancy, Pol plastic face, the quivering bowl of jello, Nancy Pelosi, all these people intentionally, Adam um uh, the Swalwell guy, who's also, he is you, I am him, you know, all this kind of existential confusion. He's running for president. All these people intentionally, they said specifically, we know there's collusion. There's no point in going over all of it all, all again. But the point being, the point being, the point being that at the end of the day, they knew that they made specific claims that they could not, that they could not, um, that they had no evidence for. They specifically said that they knew that there was collusion. They saw direct evidence of obstruction and all these other things, and none of that was there. So this irreparably damages the media's credibility, credibility that has already been destroyed. Um, almost entirely destroyed by the Covington uh, scandal, uh, the, the outrageous bias that was shown to us in Covington by, um, well, just the two years of the Mueller probe, obviously, uh, the Jussie Smollett uh, incident, which is still ongoing, the way they rushed to defend Jussie Smollett uh, and accuse Trump supporters of being racist that would dump bleach on some uh, poor gay black man's uh, body as he walked around at three in the morning in, uh, to get subway and below zero temperatures. Um, the, there's a long BuzzFeed story, you know, BuzzFeed has had numerous bombshells now that the media just goes crazy and, and establishes basically as truth. And then when it comes out that it, none of it was factual, none of it was true, they play cover up. Oh, we were just speculating. No, you guys assert things as true because it helps your narrative. And then when it doesn't, you try to play cover up. You try to then stand back and say, well, we were being objective. Nobody thinks you were being objective. If they did, why are your ratings literally cut in half overnight? Why is Sean Hannity number one? Or Tucker Carlson or Laura Ingram? Uh, why do people listen to Rush Limbaugh and not and not Rachel Mancow? You know, or, or Jeff, what is it, Scarborough or, or any of those people? Nobody listens to them anymore, and it's because they've been proven to be liars over and over and over again. 
so this this to put it in a nutshell this entirely destroys the the uh the media's uh credibility it's the final nail in the coffin the Mueller report was their last hope it was what they were pinning everything on you even saw rachel maddow uh, when William Barr's summary came out, there were tears in that woman's eyes because she realized then that our president had not colluded with the Russians. Imagine being sad that your president didn't betray your country. I can't wrap my mind around that. You know, I would be kind of glad and be like, well, things aren't as dark as I thought they would be, as, as dark as I thought they were. No, she was she was sad. She wanted our president to have betrayed our country. This is where these people are coming from. It is obviously not not a place of great patriotism, but partisan partisanship. It's obvious. So that's that's the Mueller report. That was the big thing. Um, it, to me, it was kind of a, a little thing because there was no difference between the report itself, at least that I can see or that I've heard, and William Barr's summary of it. it the same difference. Nothing new was learned. All right, number two is Notre Dame. And this is a the burning of the Notre Dame Cathedral. This is a huge deal um, because Notre Dame... I, I didn't even know a whole ton about the Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. It was not in my everyday thought process. I didn't think it was in my psyche in any way, shape, or form as a monument of great um, of uh, great meaning. Uh, but yet the burning of it, I had a very visceral reaction to it. And I think that's because there's an instinctual knowledge that that Western civilization is is in grave trouble. Uh, the foundations of it, which Notre Dame symbolizes, which is uh, Christianity. Um, now there were those that will quibble over Protestantism and Catholicism, their theology, whether one's truly Christian and the other's not. Put all that to put the theology to the side for a second. This is Christendom. The branch Roman Catholicism is under the branch of Christendom, okay, and Notre Dame is a is a huge symbol of that. It, whether you believe in Catholic theology or not, it's undeniable that it symbolizes Christianity in, in, over in Europe. It's hugely historically important as a as a building itself. Napoleon Bonaparte was crowned in it. Um, just to mention all the historical. Uh, historically significant events that have taken place around and in the cathedral. Uh, the building was over, was, and still some of it is, over a thousand years, I think a thousand years old. The ceiling was 800 years old, original wood oak, I think. Um, so this, I mean, it's tragic just on a, on, on, on the, on the surface uh, as a historical monument, it was a world heritage site, um, being destroyed. So that, that was sad, but what is more important and what I think is, is very, uh, telling is the way the media and the culture, um, largely is reacting to this. Now, I'm not talking about Christians specifically or con some conservatives. Like I was listening to Michael Savage. He understands the significance here. Stephen Molyneux, understand Molyneux or however you pronounce his name. Um, he understood the significance. You know, even Mike Cernovich, who I can't stand, he was an appallingly idiotic figure, but he even understood that, you know, he tweeted out the West has fallen, I think. Um, yeah, that was Mike Cernovich, um, who's hardly conservative, really, at the end of the day, but he understood the significance as well. But the media and a lot of people who reject Christianity don't understand this because they, they see no problem with completely pulling the foundation of Western society out from under your feet. They see no problem with that, you know. So when when milestones uh, and and uh, uh, cultural uh, milestones really within that that foundation are destroyed to them, it means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing to a lot of Europe now because a lot of Europe is not Christian anymore. You have huge sections of the population which have converted converted over to atheism. They are atheistic in their in their worldview and their ideology and their theology is non-existent. 
Uh, and then the other, that's the, that's the inborn, the, the native citizens are largely atheistic in, in Europe at large, well, specifically the UK and France, but France is a very atheistic country. And then you have the millions of migrants that have been pouring in uh, from the Middle East and from Sub-Saharan Africa. These are not Christian uh, migrants. They are largely Islamic. They are Muslims. Um, so again, the Notre Dame Cathedral has no meaning or significance to them, uh, to their faith or to anything else. They, they recognize it as a historical landmark, a, a, an architectural wonder. But as far as value and meaning um, from a cultural and religious uh point of view they they have no relation to it whatsoever and the atheists that that live in in europe in france the native french people who are atheistic their reaction to it has been something to behold in a in certain sense because they um they recognize the significance of the building from a historical aspect as well. Unlike the migrants, uh, they understand that their their past has been a Christian one. In this rep, this building, this massive, beautiful building of Gothic architecture represents uh, their Christian heritage. But it's a heritage that they have uh, withdrawn from and rejected. So the value there is just not a current value. They have no current attachment to it from a, a spirit in a spiritual way um, and the and the media reflects that in that the the main emphasis has been that a that a beautifully historical building has been destroyed uh, uh, a world heritage site um, they, they focus on the the wood beams the flying buttresses the the stained glass window that was excuse me, saved, you know, they focus on those types of things, and rightly so in a way, you know, you want to save those things, they have value, but what wasn't focused on was the fact that this is a church, a site of worship um, to God Almighty that that was destroyed, that part of it, and, and the part, the fact that, um, yeah, just the, the spiritual dimension is not focused on at all, uh, which I thought was very telling. And, and the fact that this, in in burning, well, I guess I'll get on to that now. I, 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 I've been repulsed by the media's response to it, specifically like Fox News and uh, what's that guy's name? Um, Shep, Shep, whatever his name is at Fox News. Anyone who knows Fox News will know who I'm talking about. Shep or Shepard or whatever the guy's name. I can't remember. I don't like him. I don't watch him. He's really ridiculous sometimes, but he had people on from France, uh, French citizens who were who were starting to suggest that you know how is it that the that the authorities are already concluding that this was not arson before the burning had even been quenched before before the fires had even been quenched before any type of investigation could possibly be launched they were already saying this could not possibly be arson that is ridiculous and and, and this French citizen was starting to speculate that, well, this is very suspicious. This is Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, you would think that, that they would take enormous precaution as far as fire safety and fire hazards um, in, in, during the renovations because there were renovations ongoing there. You would think that they would take enormous precautions. Just in normal buildings, they take big precautions because of lawsuit and financial responsibility, uh, not to mention that you just don't want to burn buildings to the ground and possibly kill people. Uh, but this is Notre Dame Cathedral, a World Heritage Site, a thousand-year-old building, uh, hugely uh, important to the people themselves for various reasons. Uh, you would think that they would have taken enormous precautions. So it's very suspect. Also suspect that this building caught fire on the very first day of Holy Week, okay, uh, leading up to Easter Sunday, but it was the very first day of Holy Week. That's either a divine symbol of judgment that this building burned or arson, one or the other. I mean, I don't see how it could be either of the two. If it's an accident, then I would leave, put it in the category of divine judgment rather than... 
that's just too coincidental in my book. But the media does not want to hear this. You know, the minute somebody starts saying, well, this is suspect, I think arson, you know, we have to at least look at arson. How can they possibly be saying it's not arson before the fires have even died out? Oh, sorry there. Uh, knocked over the microphone. Before the embers have even, uh, before the fires have been quenched, they're saying, no, this is not arson. That's ridiculous. It's absurd. Anyone with half a brain knows that you cannot know with any certainty that this is not arson until you launch an investigation. You can't do that until the fire's put out and you clear the rubble and the investigators go in and they do their thing. None of that has been done. So this speculation that it was just natural causes and arson and foul play have been ruled out, do not believe it. It's bullcrap, prima facie absurd. Uh, and it's very disturbing that the media would be silencing because Shep hung up on this French citizen as soon as he started, sir, sir, we will not be speculating along those lines. And he hung up on him and other people have done the same thing. And to me, that's very disturbing. And it tells me, I, I think that maybe the, the there's a possibility that they may be trying to do like damage control because they know the 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 impact this could possibly have for civil strife um, if it comes out that like a Muslim had purposely burned down the cathedral uh, you would have a Christian Muslim war going on you know so of course they're gonna want to contain the narrative and not let it go wild with conspiracy until the facts are in but don't try to lie to us and 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 talk down to us and be condescending to our intelligence by telling us that that we are stupid or there's something wrong with us for speculating that hmm this might be arson and the facts surrounding it kind of suggest that it's arson you know you're like that's like telling us we're stupid to not think along those lines to not look at the obvious okay um but yeah hugely significant event they will never be able to rebuild notre dame i realize that uh, currently i think over a billion dollars in donations have come in which is jaw-dropping uh, to rebuild Notre Dame, it can never be really rebuilt. They can rebuild the building, but the the historical parts of the building that have been destroyed, the cathedral, the, the wooden ceiling that was 800 years old, that can never be replaced. Uh, obviously, it's ash. So it's very sad, very disturbing. And they need to get to the bottom of how this fire started. They need to, if there were people responsible for setting the blaze, then they need to be brought to justice immediately and, and severe justice. Because if you let something like this go, if you allow people with just a slap on the hand to burn down uh, monuments to Christianity, World Heritage Sites, uh, then you've basically abdicated the rule of law in France at large, which has largely been abdicated anyway with the Yellow Vest protesters, Macron's despicable government there, which has trampled upon the rights of its people. Don't even get me started on that. And that's that's another video or a podcast for another time. But anyway, the, the Notre Dame thing, very, cathedral burning down, very sad, very tragic, very big news. And we'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure. Uh, lastly, I want to address, and I'm going to be doing a podcast. Um, I'm going to be doing kind of a Democrat uh, 2020 ad for my next podcast. So definitely tune in for that. It'll be coming out this coming Monday. Um, yeah, so keep an eye out for that. But I want to talk very quickly, I'm almost done here, about Paul, or no, Pete, uh, how dare he have my name, number one. He must be named Paul. If he does not take the name Peter off of him, and I'm talking about Buddha Judge, then he, I, I, I may be tempted to get my horse whip, find him, rip his shirt off, and lash him through the streets. He cannot have the same name as me. He is not worthy to be a Peter. Uh, no especially with his grasp of theology. That's what I want to talk about real quick. Just very briefly, Paul Buttigieg, I'm going to call him Paul from now on. Paul Buttigieg put out a video um, basically stating that, that the right cannot have sole ownership of Christianity. Um, and that, and that the things he sees in, in Christianity and in the Bible when he goes to church are things like helping the poor, helping the, the immigrants, the stranger amongst you. Uh, he sees a God of love. 
So this is, and, and others have written about this. Uh, the Christian Science News put out an article about how Paul Buttigieg is reviving the uh, social gospel, uh, which is basically what they call woke Christianity. My son's playing with his cars over there, if you hear that. But woke Christianity, which is a mixture of socialism and uh, race theory with Christianity. I just want to put this to rest right now. Yes, God is a God of love. He he has many attributes, okay? Um, so, in the one hand, yes, God is love in many aspects. He has divine, perfect love for, the, for his children, for the elect, for those that Christ has died for. But, on the other hand, God has perfect justice and perfect righteousness. And he, it says very clearly in the Old Testament... Esau I have hated, Jacob I have loved since eternity past, since before they were born. Okay, that not only speaks to predestination and foreknowledge, foreknowing whether he would love or hate somebody before they were even born, but it also talks about the fact that yes, he loves and yes, he hates, and he hates the sinner. Okay, so this idea that God is just perfect love and just a giant teddy bear in the sky just showering goodness and love down on top of everybody is just not true. If you are living in sin, if you are living a, a lifestyle which is di di directly and consistently and obviously uh, condemned in the Bible, such as the sin of homosexuality, which Paul Buttigieg is a homosexual who is married to his partner. He is free to live that way in America. I fully acknowledge that, and I have no desire from any legal perspective to stop him from living his life. He's free to live. He has free choice. He is, yeah, that's not my point. But the point is, from a biblical perspective, homosexuality is an abomination. There's no getting around it. If you believe the Bible is the word of God, then you have to actually read what is in it and then say, oh, okay, that's what it says. Then that's what it says. There's no changing it. There's no cutting it out. And you cannot cherry pick certain sections of the Bible that you like and then take out others that you don't like because then it's the bible is either all inspired or it's not there's only two things that that's the only two options either it's all the word of god and it's inspired and valid as a as a basically a command for how we should live our lives you know god's letter to us on how we should live and how we should worship him it's either all that way or none of it is you cannot cherry pick I like this because it, it demonstrates God's love, and I don't like this because it shows his judgment and his hatred of sin. And I'm just going to cherry pick my way through the Bible. You can't do that and be consistent and call yourself a Christian because then you're not, you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping how you want God to be, which is an idol and which isn't him. So at the end of the day, Paul Buttigieg's concept of God is not God. It is actually just his image of what he would want God to be which is an idol and it says specifically in the ten commandments you shall have no other gods before me you should not worship any image uh, and an image can it doesn't just have to be something that you've carved out of a tree or a rock or a stone or something you bow down to in a physical way an image can also be an idea that you have formulated in your mind that represent what represents what you want God to be an image of what you got uh, of what you think God should be How, who do you think you are to tell God how he should be. If you truly understand the Bible and you truly understand how what God is as a being, as the creator of the universe that he spoke in an entire universe with its billions of galaxies and little us are going to, are you going to tell him how he should be? I'm reminded, anytime I hear this kind of stuff, I'm reminded of, of the book of Job where God, it says, God answered them out of the whirlwind, asking them, demanding to know from them, because they were questioning his goodness and his justice, demanding to know from them, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I put the Leviathan in the sea? And, you know, I don't remember the specific, but 
that very first part always it always springs into my mind when I hear these kind of like Paul Buttigieg's idea of what he wants God to be because it doesn't conform to his lifestyle. Where were you when God laid the foundations of the world? And who are you, a little man, that you would tell God how he should be or what you think is right and what you think is wrong? So uh, Paul, the, the assertion that Paul Buttigieg is making that the right doesn't have a, a trademark or a patent stamp on Christianity is very true. Christianity is for all men, whether they are Gentiles or Jews or, or Italians or Irish or blah or blah or blah. White, black, red, green, purple. It, the gospel was pre is to be preached to all men. It's to be preached to, to gay people, straight people, trans people, white, black. It doesn't matter who you are. But the difference is, is that it is a transformation. It is a transformative message. So when you hear the gospel and you receive the gospel, you repent, you trust Christ, you become a Christian. You do not, if you're living in sin, you do not just stay in that sin. There is sanctification. There is progression forward. So in that sense, the gospel is progressive in that sense. You're right, Buddha judge, but you're not right in the sense of which you would talk about it. Yes, the gospel is progressive, but in a different way. Um, you do not just stay in a state of sin. You can struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin. I struggle with plenty of sins. Sometimes I get very depressed about it because it just seems like, you know, no forward progress gets made sometimes. But then other times forward progress is being made. And I see definite change, you know. But it's a struggle. It always is. Um, but to just suggest that, you know, God made me, you know, he made the suggestion or he claimed that Mike Pence's problem was not with him, Paul Buttigieg, but with his creator. OK, because he was he, he says, if I if I was not born gay, then this was a decision that was made above my pay grade. So in other words, God made me this way. If you have a problem with me being gay, then talk to God. I've heard a lot of people really struggle with with this concept that gay people were made gay and therefore how can it be a problem but you have to if if you're a christian and the bible is your standard you have to that's your foundation you have to work off of that and the bible clearly says that there's something wrong with being gay romans 1 talks about it exchanging natural passions and were consumed with lust for one another therefore god turned them over to their sinful condition uh basically just rubbing their nose in the in the dung as it were um it, it's called an abomination. They're stoned in the in the Old Testament for being gay. This is it, it, it's roundly condemned throughout the Bible. So that's your foundation. It has to be. Otherwise, don't call yourself a Christian. Okay, that's just how it is. You cannot call yourself a Christian and reject the foundation of Christianity. So if the Bible is your foundation, you work up off of that. This is a sin. Now. The assertion that uh, I will grant to you that there probably are some people, maybe Paul Buttigieg is one of them, where his homosexuality is is born within him. In other words, he was born with a natural inclination um, towards other men. I think from a lot of other people, I don't, I largely do not believe that narrative because I think the way you were raised, the the uh, circumstances of your raising, your childhood, what happens in it, was there abuse, you know, did you, like Ernest Hemingway, did your mother dress you up in women's clothing when you're five and six years old or up until six, like Hemingway, um, which would suggest that, okay, it makes sense that you have gender confusion and maybe weird attractions but so I think you, your childhood your your culture um, what is going on around you the circumstances around your raising and your growing your formative years uh, those play a huge part in in whether you have an inclination one way or another sexually so I, I don't think that can be discounted and and a lot of people want to want to jump on the bandwagon and say I was born this way who who deep down know that X Y and Z that happened in my life early on played a huge role in that priesthood abuses could play a huge role in that there's a lot that can happen 
that will influence you to one degree or another to choose that as an orientation. I think it is largely, in a lot of ways, a choice. And I've heard homosexuals who have repented and come back to the faith speak of this, you know, that it was, it, it's like a legitimate addiction and it was a choice for them. So the, there, there are many that admit that it is a choice. Uh, they're not all just born this way. Now, I will take Paul Buddha judge at his, at, at his word that he was born this way. Let's just for the sake of argument do that. that. That still does not necessarily mean that it's the right way to live or it's moral or immoral. That makes no determination whether something's moral or immoral just because you're born with an inclination in a certain di in direction. Again, if you're a Christian, use the Bible as your foundation, okay? The Bible very clearly speaks of original sin. In original sin, you were born with a sinful nature. So in other words, you're born spiritually dead and cut off from God. And so there are going to be many different inclinations that you have that you are born with, with this sin nature, um, that you were born with, okay? And, and homosexuality could very well be that for some people, okay? It, it does not mean just because you're born with it, if you're born with original sin, with a sin nature, then it would make sense then that you will be born with certain inclinations that are not right. Uh, so, the, so the argument that I was just born with this and this is me and that means that it's right, it, it's in our culture, it is something that has been largely accepted. This idea in our culture that that you are the antithesis, antithesis of per, or that you are the definite, just be, you being you is the ultimate good. That, that whatever you are is good and that and so the idea of change or redemption or improvement has been largely rejected and the worship of self as self is the very core of who you are is what should be worshiped and 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 be really aspired to rather than changing or perfecting or transforming or bettering those things are, are rejected in 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 su and in substitute they place just you with your flaws and your any just you at your core is what should be worshipped and and aspired to no matter what this is wrong uh, it, it, so the assertion that just because you're born with it is not an argument for um, for it being good. Uh, serial killers, and I'm not conflating the two homosexuals and serial killers, okay, or pedophiles or anything like that. I'm not saying they're the same. So before you jump on me, but to say that just serial killers, I, I've read biographies like T Ted Bundy and some of the others. Um, George Hazram, I think, was a, a maniacal serial killer, rapist and, and murderer, hundreds of victims. And he, in his writings and in interviews with him, if I remember right, was very open about the fact that from his earliest uh, point of consciousness as a child, he had a malicious desire to inflict pain on people. He was, so according to him, he was born with this desire to hurt, maim, kill. And you actually see that in the development and in the lives, the early lives of a lot of people that we characterize as psychopaths and killers. Very often they will show uh, traits uh, that, that or there, there will be instances that you can point to like uh, of hurting animals and hurting their brother or their sister or being a bully. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can point to from a very early age during their formative, formative years, from their earliest points of consciousness that, that they had this inclination towards hurting, towards dominating, towards power, exerting power over somebody else. So even killers will say to you, I was born with this desire to hurt, to maim, to control, to overpower, to dominate. Um, other people will say the same thing uh, with, to varying degrees with other uh, pro just um, other desires, uh, other ways of life. Just, so if a killer can say I was born with this and accurately point to back to his formative years and his earliest uh, states of earliest years of consciousness that 
farthest back he can remember, he can say, I was born with this desire, or I remember that I wanted to inflict pain or to dominate. If he can say that, then it, to me, in a lot of ways, erases the argument that just because you're born with something, that makes it good. A lot of us, I will say for myself, I was probably born with a lot of characteristics which I needed to change over time. And if I had just said, well, I was born with that, I really wouldn't have gotten very far in life. My son's laughing at me right now. Um, he knows. He knows. So, long story short, just don't buy into this uh, ridiculous uh, woke gospel, this idea that, that God is just a giant teddy bear. Uh, always, you have to always keep in mind God's justice as well, because one balances out the other. You, his love, um, it, God cannot overlook sin, just remember that. Um, I've gone on way too long here. I don't know if anyone will even listen to this till the end, but these are things that I felt like had to be addressed, and I didn't want to wait, bless you, I didn't want to wait till the end of the week uh, with the podcast, because the next podcast episode, I wanted to be kind of humorous, I'm going to put out a Democratic ad, um, probably for Paul Buttigieg, I'm going to be Paul Buttigieg, I'm going to shave, comb my hair, put on a tie, and be like, my fellow Americans, I am Paul Buttigieg, <laughs> anyway. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm going to put this up right now. So, good night. God be with you. Or actually, good day. Good Friday. Good Friday to you all.